Thanks for joining us here for the U.S. government workshop number two. What do I do as an instructor at workshop? I'm Stefan Pearls, and we are lucky to have with us Scott Pingrazi. Scott, thanks so much for taking the time to just kind of walk us through what you do as an instructor and how other instructors can implement statecraft into their class. So I'm going to hand it over to you. Yeah, just a, a brief introduction. Um, this is uh, my 13th year teaching at University of Liggett School in Gross Point Woods, Michigan. Uh, this will be my third year teaching 10th grade civics. So throughout the course of my 13 years, I've taught different government and politics related electives. Uh, and this will be my third year using statecraft in the classroom. Um, I've used it uh, for four other um, semester long courses and I use uh, statecraft as the culminating assessment in the class. And so uh, our final unit is, is um, really focused on the simulation um, and, and how students use it and, and, and how they make decisions as a result of uh, the, the issues they're confronted with. Um, and so uh, the first thing that we want to be able to do today is uh, to show you the registration process uh, and, and, and kind of help you figure out for students uh, the best way to introduce it uh, in your class. Uh, and so going to this link uh, on the page, uh, us.statecraftsim.com, uh, and you'll want to um, copy over the, uh, the, the, the code. And when you're here uh, and, and, and you're telling your students about this, uh, you click on that student account. You're gonna click on the not registered yet button. And then you're gonna go ahead and you're gonna put in that code. Once you get there, you're gonna see some personal uh, kind of information up at the top. And that's how you can always tell your students that, hey, you're in the right spot. Uh, you have the school uh, and the name of your school will generally be there the course number is and the course name. So one thing you'll want to make sure that the students uh, do is make sure that they fill out this information um, and, and make sure, of course, that it's accurate. I always encourage students um, to use their uh, school-issued uh, email address. Uh, and so um, that kind of general information um, and, and creating a password um, is something that uh, is a really key step to get to, to get right first. And, and doing it in advance, I think it's really important if you can do the registration process, doing that with enough time to adjust if necessary uh, or to reach out to Statecraft is, is usually helpful. And then hit the sign up button. That's going to take you to a set of uh, what, what's called assignment questions. And, and these are two really interesting ones to walk through uh, your uh, with your students. Uh, and so the first one, in this simulation, are you interested in playing a role that involves significant responsibility and the power to affect what happens to other players? Uh, 10 being that absolutely, you know, and they outline some examples for you. And one, no, I'd, I'd rather have a smaller role. And this is a good opportunity uh, for the students to kind of think about like how in, how involved they want to be in this process, how comfortable are they making difficult decisions? And again, it's you're 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 not really asking them, in, though you could uh, to fully articulate why that's the case. But putting in that number um, will help the students kind of you know give the simulation a sense of of where they want to be throughout the process. And then question two is about uh, extroversion, right? How much do you enjoy talking and socializing with other people? So again, 10, it's my favorite thing to do. One, I prefer to be on my own socially and uh, in school work settings. And so this allows a student to kind of self-assess kind of where they want to go. Uh, you know, since I'm a civics teacher, since I, I'm, I, I've, I've been enjoying this process for the last few years, I'm going to go ahead and put 10 and 10. And then you hit next step. So that's going to bring you to choose assignment tags. Now there's a there's a couple different ways to go about this one, and I've I've really done it two two different ways. Um, I'm going to show you uh, uh, some examples of an activity I do when we start this uh, in class, um, and and you could do that process beforehand uh, and kind of allow students to collect information on all these different roles, and then kind of go through that presentation and say, oh, you know what, let me rank uh, five of these positions that I really like. Uh, or there's a way in which you can kind of do it. Hey, we've talked about these positions throughout the course of our class. Do, do a quick look through, go back through the resources that we've used, um, it, it, you know, whether it be on a site that you have or in your textbook or, or whatever the case might be, 
and, and kind of recall what these positions are about, right? Uh, I've done it both ways, depending on how much time I have. Uh, and they've both worked out pretty well for our students to think about uh, the role that they want to do. So again, you know, I selected 10 and 10. So maybe I'm thinking some leadership positions in here. Um, and, uh, and maybe I'm thinking, you know, uh, of positions perhaps um, in government um, that are perhaps, you know, interesting or important. Um, or perhaps they, they have not heard of. So if I'm picking 10 and 10, I'm thinking maybe I want to be actually a, a position in government, not one that is perhaps uh, in the media or the ACLU. Uh, and then once you have your five, go ahead and they can hit next step. So then I'll give you a few instructions here at the end. You will be assigned a position once period zero begins. During period zero, you'll play through your character in a low stakes situation. And I, and I do really make that clear to the students that there's an opportunity to learn not only how to use the simulation, um, but also um, to, to learn about your role and what your responsibilities are going to be. Uh, at that point, I have them hit the, you know, have them hit the done button and I have them show me this. And I say, hey, I want to see that screen that says you'll be assigned a position period zero and, and you have the Capitol building uh, in the background. Uh, and I, I want to do this to make sure everyone's signed up at, at the same time, uh, kind of, you know, in the same process so that if there are any issues or there's student, students absent, I can kind of focus on making sure I, I reach out to Statecraft and make sure I get them signed up in time for the simulation to start. That's why having that little bit of a grace period of a week um, in between is, is really important just to make sure you got all the, kind of the details uh, ironed out. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to flip back here uh, to our presentation. Um, we're we're going to go back into the simulation a little bit later, um, but just kind of wanted to point out some things um, that uh, that that I often think about, and uh, that's the expectation for students. Um, you know, I I use this as a culminating assessment in my class, um, and and so that means that down the line we're going to be doing it. But I start in my first day. Uh, talking about the simulation, saying, here's where we're heading, right? Here's what we're going towards. I don't give them a ton of information, but I kind of give them a few details, let them know that they're going to actually have a role that has responsibilities and they're going to have to make choices um, and, and, and kind of start laying the groundwork. I also put it in my syllabus, um, depending on whether your school is going to charge students um, or not. You may want to put the price in there. Um, I'm coming up to back, uh, back to school night. Next week, I'm I'm going to mention it to parents there. I put it in my syllabus. I eventually send an email out. Um, but I did want to point out also within Statecraft, there's a lot of information for an instructor to use, right? Uh, there's a template for a syllabus. If you want to completely integrate the simulation into your course, when you log into your, um, your professor dashboard uh, under documents. And so I did want to point that out, that you're going to have that, that ability um, to, uh, to, to get information that Statecraft has provided uh, that can really help explain not only to your students, um, but also uh, to the parents, right, um, the value in, in the course. Speaking of other expectations, you know, thinking about the notion of grading, again, um, this is something that, you know, I've certainly thought a lot about how I want to use this uh, as a part of my class, again, using it as a culminating assessment. It has a significant impact um, in, in terms of the, uh, the, the assessments in the class and, and the total points as it relates to the class. So, um, again, uh, encourage using grading. I think it builds in um, a a sense of significance uh, and importance within the class, but also gives the students some benchmarks to think about. Um, and so, you know, there's there's a lot of different ways that you can do it um, within the game. And I know in our first kind of tutorial, um, professional development last month, we talked about SP and, and its value in terms of figuring out how, st how students are doing within the game. And you certainly could use the SP as a, as a factor in terms of grading. I don't. Um, I, I tend to use it as a benchmark for student engagement a little bit, having discussions with students about how much they're putting into the simulation and how much they're getting out of it. I think it also can be a good lesson. Uh, you know, there's there's going to be moments in, in students' uh, lives where they put everything into something and it just doesn't turn out the way that they necessarily want to. And I think there's a lot of value in that too. And, and, and sometimes SP can, can be that way, right? Um, I wanted to put up a rubric that I, I generally use. Um, this is something that our department uh, uses uh, in terms of skill development. We've identified particular skills based on each grade. Uh, and in the 10th grade, 
Uh, these are some of the skills that we've outlined. And so this is not only a rubric that they'll see in my 10th grade civics class, they've seen a version of it in their ninth grade world history class, maybe slightly different language or slightly different expectations. They see it in their 10th grade U.S. history class, uh, and they would expect to see it in their electives going forward. And, and all we do is kind of add on to the skills. So it's something they're already familiar with. Uh, but the way that I look at it when I'm when I'm assessing work uh, with assignments um, is I think about connections to government. So can you properly identify an issue uh, that you face in the simulation? And sometimes I'll do this over one period or two periods. Um, approaches to learning. I'm, I'm really big, and I know I talked a lot about um, planning out how you use your XP in our last tutorial um, and, and, and thinking about your moves before you make them. So explaining a real cost of the action, right? What could you stand to lose? Um, and then also a benefit. What are you hoping to gain, right? Or what do, what do you hope comes out of it? Uh, research. Can you use the specifics? I'm really big in showing the students that, hey, you're not just clicking buttons. When you click a button, it's providing you with a little bit more information. And then when you click that next button, it's putting it into the simulation and, it's, and it's, it's forcing a change, right? And more is going to come out of that. And so gathering that information, I'm really big on having the students take screenshots uh, and, and saving that information that's shared with them in the game for, for maybe brief moments of time. So can they, can they use actual information from the game to enhance their discussion of the choices that they made? Um, and, and then also, I, I provide a lot of supplementary resources, which I know down the line I'm, I'm going to talk about in, in, in future tutorials. Um, can, can they use that information from our units um, that I've provided to supplement, to add context? Can they tie that into to the particular issue that they're facing right uh, in, in that particular period of the simulation? And then finally, communication, right? Is it clear and easy to follow, right? If I'm asking you to provide a certain number of sentences or paragraphs, are they well constructed? Did you proofread them? Um, trying to, you're, you know, all this information I tell the students would be shared with somebody else, whether it be a superior, um, someone else working within the particular aspect of government, uh, internally at a media company, right, or within the ACLU, you always want to put your best work forward. Um, and so making sure that that, that information that you share is clear, uh, concise, but also, um, you know, uh, represents you well. Um, and so I know, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not talking about a particular assignment uh, in, in this space. And that's something that we're going to have uh, do in more depth uh, when we get to November. So in terms of the daily schedule, when you play, how much you play inside of class, outside of class, uh, really, um, you know, that that's something that it, it's got to fit your particular uh, class, your particular schedule, um, kind of, uh, you know, how, how you see it fitting into your program. As I mentioned, I use this as a culminating assessment. So when we get to the simulation, that's what we focus on all the time. Uh, and so, um, you know, the nice thing is you have a way to construct your periods when you log in um, uh, behind your kind of professor login uh, to figure out how long you need for each period. And I think that's where, um, you know, someone like Stefan and the, and the statecraft people have been a great resource. Like period one, you know, this is kind of what goes on. Here's my, how much time, you know, we think you need, but maybe period three is a little bit more in depth. You might want to set aside more time. Once you go through it and, and, and kind of do it for one class or for one semester, you you, you get the you, you kind of get the pacing. Um, but you, there's resources there. Um, there's people there at Statecraft to kind of help you figure that out if it's your first time. Um, the way that I kind of look at it is, um, you know, we're going to take our entire class period and, 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 and focus on it in this unit. But we might not always be in the game. Right. If I if I set aside two or three class periods, um, you know, and we use block scheduling. So more or less, we meet every other day. Um, that first class period uh, might be all kind of research, thinking about our moves, looking at supplementary resources, talking with other people in the class. Um, and then the next day we might play. Right. And then maybe the third day we justify our decisions. Um, and so finding that that appropriate balance. Right. And I think it's really important to leave the game open. You know, there, there's a good question about whether or not and they'll ask you when you're setting up your class, whether or not you want students playing inside or uh, class only or inside and outside of class. I think it's really important to leave it open. Um, the amount of conversations I've accidentally run into turning the corner of the hallway and seeing students kind of talking and plotting out. Um, well, that's, a, that's one of those moments where you kind of get a smile on your face. Like, hey, this is this is working, right? Um, and, you know, it gives students an opportunity perhaps to um, step outside the class and share some information they wouldn't want to with, with everybody listening. So I think having that, you know, 
the game's always on, right? Just like in real life, the you know the the concerns of government never never stop, right? Uh, is is kind of adds a little bit of a real world factor to it. So class days, uh, as I mentioned, um, you know, what will in class look like? I gave kind of a, a, a little bit of an overview there. Um, I did want to talk about kind of the first day, right? And, and how you might use this um, to, to get kick started. And I, I mentioned when you're looking at the position tags, the fact that's going to list all these positions, right? If you're using it like I'm using it, which is at the end of the semester, my hope is that the students have pretty decent recall that these positions are involved in government uh, and, and perhaps a uh, a majority of them, they still, you know, can make connections about what they do, what branch they're assigned to, and things like that. Obviously, you know, for media, uh, which, you know, it's not a real media organization, though the media organizations mirror different types of media that we see that, that uh, impact government. Um, and perhaps the ACLU, they may need a little bit of, you know, um, help and support with. Uh, but at the same time, um, having this kind of sim simulation preparation. What role will you play in the simulation? Um, I've done it a few different ways. I've done it before we signed up. I've done it the day we've signed up. And I've even done it after we've signed up. Um, and so, uh, you know, the way that I would look at it is before anyone's assigned a role, if you were going to do it, I will randomly have kind of the positions written up on a little slip of paper. And as kids come in, I'm just handing them out. And they, they randomly get assigned a role. Uh, and then they're going to open up a, a, a Google Slides presentation. I think I showed it um, in the in the August tutorial. Uh, but I'm asking them two questions, and I'm taking a little bit of time. I give them three minutes, silent reflection, and, and typing. What do you think this job does? And so, again, hopefully some recall there from earlier in the semester, um, you know, ma making some inferences. Uh, and then I say, okay, five minutes, go back, use every resource that we have in our class, government websites. Now fill in, what does this role actually do? And if you use it that way, then you have a little bit of a basis, right? Maybe you have 20 kids in your class, 30 kids, whatever the case might be. You have a little bit of information for, uh, for each of those roles. And then when the students sign up, they can reference that, right? They can like, well, what does this director of national intelligence do? Here's a slide of information really quickly. Um, or the executive director of the ACLU, what, what does that position do? Um, this, uh, you know, GNN re reporter. Well, what does a reporter do for an organization that sounds like a, a, a TV media outlet that the kids might be familiar with? Um, just a little bit of something to help them with that. I've also done it the other way where, all right, we're going to sign up. These are a lot of positions that now I'm asking you to recall from previous units. If you need to go look it up, fine, make your choices. And then when they get assigned the role, then I have them do this exercise as a way for them to start to build more knowledge or more specific knowledge, I should say, um, uh, uh, about their particular role. I think it can function in multiple different ways, but at least putting the positions in front of them before they start making choices in the game um, is, is one way I prepare. And I do this in, in period zero or, or before period zero sometimes. Um, so this could be an easy kind of what, what you do outside of the game. And then you could go into the kind of the tutorial session. So uh, one thing I did kind of want to talk about here um, is the role of political advisor in the game. Um, and I, I know, I'm, uh, you know, Stefan and I talked about this a little bit, and I, I sometimes use it. I feel like my job is a little bit chief of staff at times. Um, but the, the, the way I kind of look at it is, what am I going to say? What am I going to do in these moments when a student calls me over and says, what does this mean? What should I do? How, how to respond in those moments. I think that's mostly your job while they're playing the simulation. Um, when, when we start doing it in class, I'm, I'm up, I'm moving around, I'm asking who needs help. Slowly, I try to back away, right? Even to the point where there's some days where I'm just sitting at my desk because I'm trying to show them you, now, now it's all on you, right? So, you know, slowly backing away from, from being engaged in those conversations. But the way that I look at it, um, as my role as, as a political advisor or chief of staff or whatever you want to call it, um, is to encourage student agency. When a student says, should I do this? My first response is, well, why do you want to do this? Or why should you do this, right? Um, I, I don't ever want to answer that question directly. Um, and that can be a little bit maddening for the students and because they want, they want a response in that moment. Um, but at the same time, I think as much as, because you, you've done a whole semester, right, where 
You know, there's a lot of going over content. There's a lot of answering questions, giving feedback on the students' responses. This is an opportunity to fully step back um, and, and try to embrace that a little bit. And for someone who who doesn't always embrace that that well, or is at least afraid of embracing that, this has been a good way for me to, to, to get a little bit more comfortable with that. Ask questions and where students would find, and, and then help the students find the answers, right? Or, or help the students know that the answers are out there and they can look them up, right? Or they can they can talk to somebody else, right? And, and I mentioned that in the last one, I almost never respond with a comment. It's almost always a question back to them. Um, and then that notion that the sim is emotionally engaging, foster it, um, encourage their discomfort with that, encourage their discomfort with not, with not knowing what's going to happen, right? I, I tell students all the time, you know, there is going to be no A plus at the end of this road. There, there, there won't really be an F either necessarily, right? It's that notion of we'll see what happens. You need to make the decision based on the information you have. And your goal should be to try to gather more information. I think uh, back the example that, you know, I think I was most proud of last year uh, was when a bill failed in the class and the majority whip um, was just running around the school trying to find people to support. And I, and I knew the majority of what was not going to get the 67% necessary because I knew where other students had landed that because you can kind of see this come in. But I kept saying like, hey, you know, this is part of your job. This is a struggle, right? Uh, and that student really responded to it. Uh, and, and it was a student that had been relatively mixed on the class, I would say, to that point. And, and from that point on, fully engaged, fully involved, uh, some resolve, right? Uh, after the discussion, we don't always win. We don't always accomplish what we want to. Um, but from that point forward, yeah, that mistake wasn't going to happen. That person wasn't going to wait for the bill to, 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 to get vetoed again, right? They were building that support just in case. The, no the notion of emails and, and communication uh, to kind of support specific students, um, you know, I, I one, the, the messaging center is great in the game. All the information goes and filters into their messaging center. Um, but both the ability of the student to email, you know, me outside of class about it, to email statecraft support. Um, I think encouraging that that constant communication uh, because not all these answers are going to be right in front of them, right? Um, maybe perhaps even it's between students. Um, that notion that, well, you know, there's somebody in the class who probably has this information and having them figure out a way to not just yell across the room, who knows this, right? But behind the scenes, gather that information and reach out to some people and see who knows what and who's willing to share um, what they know. Um, and to me, it's always, it's, you know, it's, it's gathering that information together. And then how can you connect the dots? Uh, the students that work with each other um, often are able to find that, hey, I, I have a piece of the information. I don't have all of it. And nobody has all of it, not even the president necessarily. Um, and so finding the way to, to, to work together, that's what I will often say is like, well, there's, there's people that are sitting near you that probably could help you better than I can, even, you know, even if that might be a little untrue, uh, but at least get some thinking, okay, somebody else out there has that answer if, 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 if he's not going to give it to me. In terms of best practices, um, I think providing the structure and, and, and supplement with real world e uh, examples. So, you know, whatever you can do, what what will that class period look like? Um, you know, I mean, there is a way, of course, to just set it and go. Um, but I do think that you're setting the students up for success if you're kind of giving them the information uh, that they need without pointing a big si flashing sign that says, here's what you need, right? And so, you know, giving them the tools um, in, in terms of resources, and then setting a classroom structure that's familiar so that they know, here's when I'm I'm plotting out my moves. Here's when I'm negotiating with other students. Here's when I'm making my decisions. And then here's when I'm reckoning with the decisions that I made. Um, hopefully not necessarily in, in a negative way, right? But thinking back on, on, on what they did, what, what choices they made and how that impacted the simulation. Um, again, I think incentivizing correctly, I've, I've struggled with that notion of SP, right? Like if someone gets to 120 SP in the game, should I be like rewarding that person? And then sometimes I think about the motives though, of what they might've been doing to get to that point. Um, and so thinking about that, that, that idea of how, how can someone succeed and, and show you in multiple ways. Um, the one nice thing that Statecraft will do is they'll send you a report after each period and they'll say, here's some students that need some help, right? Well, that's when you can reach out to them and say, hey, you know, I noticed you're struggling a little bit or, or maybe, hey, I noticed you haven't made a lot of moves. Tell me why. 
Um, sometimes it's a student who just says, I'm afraid if I make a decision, it's wrong. And then you can reorient them about that notion of, you know, what, what's right and what's wrong or, or what it means to be inactive, right? And, and, the, and the results of, of inactivity in the game. Um, but then it'll also tell you, here are the students that are doing really well. And if you have a participation grade in the class, um, or you have, you know, some sort of grade that, that, that looks at effort versus perhaps, you know, completion um, or, or the content analysis that a student submits with their assignments, maybe that's a place where you say, hey, I notice, right? I notice you, you doing this. And a lot of times I, I found it's the students that are not traditionally getting the, the, the highest grade in the class. Um, it's usually the students that may have struggled um, to, to stay engaged in, in previous units or more traditional units. I mentioned this before, but as much as you can encourage debate, and I put both public and private, I, as I told you, I, I love running into a conversation in the hallway um, and, and students um, debating um, fervently what, what, what they've seen in class, right? And, and every now and again, you'll see students who are, and they got, they're got they doing it with a smile on their face, but they're kind of you know raising their voices with each other um, because they need someone else to help them accomplish their goals, right? Um, and so encourage that. Um, you know, one thing I think I mentioned on, on a slide down the line uh, that we'll get to when we talk about, um, you know, how to, how to use the dashboard and how, and how to how, how to set up your class uh, is grouping students. You know, I, I put the legislature together. I put the executive branch together. I group ACLU and media um, because one, I think it inherently starts conversation, right? Um, and it also gets some of them to learn that their best friend in the class that they always talk to might actually not be working in the same direction that they are. Uh, and that's a good lesson to learn too, right? That, hey, sometimes you're gonna be grouped with individuals and you have to work as a team. Um, and it's not always gonna be your best friends and, and, and you need to rely on other people. So the the for for my section, who to invite? Uh, who I brought into my classroom on this? My social studies department chair. Unfortunately, he's exceptionally supportive, um, and is always interested and uh, loves hopping in and playing uh, get the game with the students, playing the simulation. Uh, I've had program uh, deans come into class uh, during my. Um, during my formal evaluations. Um, and that's been a really, and, and uh, you know, they're counting them getting students involved and how, how well they seem to know what's going on as a result of that um, has certainly been a plus. And then other teachers, uh, as part of our professional development programming at my school, um, there's a year in the cycle where we have to go out and find another teacher. So I partnered with someone um, from a completely different school district, completely different, um, uh, uh, material that, 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 that he was teaching his class and, and now they're getting ready to use statecraft. Um, and so, you know, having a teacher with a strong economics background coming to class, he, he made me think about some things that I hadn't even been talking about. Right. Um, and just getting another set of eyes, even if they don't know the simulation, they're going to share things with you. And so, um, I think it's always good to have those, you know, even if they haven't played the game or, or know what the game is, you know, they might catch something that you don't. Yeah, so now we want to take you and show you uh, some things that are on the student dashboard that I think can be very valuable to, to explain to the students so that they kind of know where they're going. Uh, so Stefan's going to pull up uh, the student dashboard on his end, and I'll, I'll talk about a few of these things that we have listed here. All right. This should be the student dashboard, uh, the instructor dashboard with a bunch of students. These are all made up students. We don't share that information. So uh, Scott, tell me where you want to dive into, and I'll happy to be happy to navigate for you. Go ahead and uh, pick Taylor there. We'll go with Taylor Hauser. So yeah, uh, the first thing that we want to show you, and go ahead and click on actions. Um, you know, I, one of the things I like the most, just connecting to how students think about things, is I, you know, when you get like that, you have your e your email app, and it has like fifteen hundred missed messages on your phone. Um, well, this is kind of like your action bubbles. We'll tell you how many different things you can do, and the students immediately know, right? That okay, when I see those action bubbles, that means I have options. Um, I tell them though, because of, of course the first thing they want to do is dive in, right? And start clicking, you know, I, I remind them, Hey, look at your position goals. Right. Uh, and so I'll have the students really look, look through those. And the one thing I'll tell them is, you know, it's, it's really important that you don't necessarily share these with other individuals in the class. Um, there are students that have a position goal that's completely opposite of yours. Right. Uh, and so you may want to take some time to talk to people start with people in your branch of government or your kind of 
um, area of the simulation and then work from there. And, and, and you should try to figure out what everybody else wants, right? But keep your position goals close. Um, and, and, and that way I tell students like, here, here's what you want to accomplish. The way that you will accomplish it is by performing actions. And so making sure that the students know that you can't click on a position goal, right? And, and, and do things. It's through the actions that you'll figure out how to accomplish your position goals. Um, and so going over to the action section, uh, you have a lot of different functions. Uh, this person's a Senate majority leader. They can gather information. And in that one, they can do a lot of polling. And I tell the students, hey, if you want to know where something stands, right, you got it. You got to gather that data. Uh, and so polling will allow it to do it. You could pull a, the approval ratings of, of anyone in the simulation that is uh, an elected official. And you can see kind of all the options there. Uh, and then you can also pull a bill. And so in each period, there's different bills that, that Congress is going to have to move or not move through. Uh, and so you can pick the particular one you want to focus on. Uh, and what that's going to do, obviously, is give you that information. And, and up in the messaging center, and this is one of the ways that you can communicate within the game, uh, that's where your poll readout is going to go. So when you commission a poll, uh, it's going to show up in here, and it's going to give you a percentage, right? And then when you go back to your actions and you look at your options under position goals, well, maybe, you know, if, if there's something in particular you, you want to do, how do your constituents feel about it? Maybe how does the country in general feel about it? Where's congressional approval at at this point? Um, and so under gathering info, you can you kind of get a lot of the information you need. Uh, obviously, as a Senate majority leader, you have the ability to call for votes. Um, and so if the Senate majority leader doesn't call for a vote, the rest of Congress, or I should say the rest of the Senate, can't vote on it, right? And so again, students need to realize um, that, uh, that there are different people they have to rely on. Um, if you go under the help button, and this is something um, that really, you know, for the first time, I, I I knew this information was there, but I didn't know there was a great graphic to go along with it. Students go, how do you know, how do I pass a bill in the game? How is it different than what we learned? Right. Well, you can click on that passing a bill. If you click on that function right there, there's a nice graphic to go along with that, that textual information uh, to show them how it happens. Um, in the simulation. And, and, and you know, the first time around, it's going to be a little slow, but that's good. That means the students are figuring out the process. And then from there, they know exactly what they have to do, right? Uh, and, you know, if the Senate majority leader is absent and there's some frustration in the Senate that day, a lot of texts or, or emails are going out saying, hey, hey, can you log in wherever you're at and, put, you know, put get this started for us? So again, you know, there there, there are ways to do it if, if some students aren't in class. Um, so, um, in in terms of in, in terms of your actions and your position goals, they are very much connected. And and to me, I think it's important to point that out to the students. There is a way to kind of let them free and and do that. And that's and and that and that can work too. Um, but at the same time, if the students see that the way to accomplish your position goals is to perform a set of actions that that connect to that, um, then I think they're they're kind of moving in the right direction right away. Of course, as a member of the Senate you got to get reelected eventually, right? And so you got to click on the campaign functions there. And this has the ability to eventually, maybe directly, maybe indirectly help start to improve your approval rating, right? Uh, and so if you go back to position goals, you know, somewhere along that line at position goals to get reelected. Well, it's right at the top for the Senate Majority Leader, right? Uh, and so that's a way to get SP, but you got to get your approval rating to, to 60%. And so you want to pull where you're at at the start of the simulation and figure out where you got to go. A uh, real cool thing about that is I've, I've had students in their debriefing presentation all the way at the end create a graph tracking the change in their approval rating. Um, it's a basic graph, right? But it's it's them kind of showing how things change. Um, and, you know, instead of just throwing in an image or, or, or something like that, they're creating their kind of their own information. Um, you have media abilities, right? You have your way to shape the public, uh, public's opinion. You have your way to shape congressional opinion. You have your way to uh, give information and build relationships, maybe mutually benef uh, beneficial relationships uh, with the media. Um, and so, um, again, that's an option to you as well. And then down there, we have budget and move votes. Again, more actions um, that you would imagine the Senate Majority Leader would want to have the ability to do um, as the simulation uh, progresses. So again, I see position goals and actions is very much connected and in the students understanding 
not only um, how they're slightly different, but how they how they work together to accomplish what you need to in the simulation. I mentioned communication. Uh, there is that uh, messaging center up there in the upper right hand corner. I tell students, you know, archive the messages that are really important. Right. And so there is a way in the simulation to click kind of those check boxes and move it to an archive folder because like our real inboxes, they can become really cluttered uh, by week three, week four and saving the key pieces of information. They're organized chronologically for you, too. So it's going to help you tell your story of, uh, of what you chose to do in the simulation and, and why you chose to do it. Also, I would bring up um, again under that help function. Um, there's always a good way to to kind of if if you have I always tell students if you have a question start there right maybe it will be answered uh, along the left hand side if you can't find an answer and then you come to me and I don't have the answer uh, I remind them that if you find that red question mark right there in the upper right hand corner you can go ahead you put in your name your last name your email um, the subject and then what your particular question is. And generally, I find that the students get a response by the end of the school day. You know, I'm in I'm in Michigan, you know, state crafts in a different part of the country, but yet by the end of the school day, usually the students have their answer. So even if it's a morning class, I tell them, okay, pump the brakes. You're going to get a response here. We're going to be able to adjust even if the end of the period's coming up. Uh, and this is a way that they can directly communicate. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I've had Stefan zoom into my class and, and talk to the students. So they already, they are, there's a face attached to that for my students as well. And so, you know, that notion of like, am, am I just going to get an automated response back? Now they know somebody, somebody's going to respond to them and, and, and kind of help them out with that. Um, and so on the dashboard, I, I, I do actually spend probably a good 15, 20 minutes in that period zero, walking them through each, each of the functions. Um, because uh, I think it's important they know how to use it before they jump in and, and, and start click, clicking buttons. Um, again, um, you know, some of the options to kind of get conversation going, um, splitting them into groups. I, I, I create four different sections in the room um, and, and, and give each kind of group of students that might work to naturally work together their own space. I find that fosters, con fosters conversation. I've had students ask as a group to go to the library to have a conference or a meeting out of earshot of another group. Um, I've had students ask to go on a nice day. Hey, can I go right out? Can we go right outside so that this, this, uh, you know, the media doesn't overhear what we're talking about. Um, and so that really gets students going in, in, in that sense. And again, you know, as always, getting them to talk to each other. Um, I know uh, I should add Stefan stay on the dashboard there for a second, but um, even if they, for, like at the beginning, this is the most important period zero, but they they start to know by the end. Uh, if you go where the, the individual is with the commencement uh, gown in the upper right-hand corner, uh, right there, um, you know, when students are like, well, who can help me do this? I, I tell them, hey, click on this, look at the roles, go back to that presentation that we created um, that, that has a, what each job does. And then you can kind of figure out, oh, this person is likely working in the same direction as me. Um, maybe I'll reach out to them. Or this person I know needs to publish stories and I got some information, but I also need some, some information too. Um, and so there's a way to kind of communicate not only by tag, if you're in a larger class perhaps, um, you know, most of my, my classes are somewhere between 10 and 20 students. So they're more likely to know their the name of the individual and then connect a role to them. But if you need to connect via a role and find the right person, you can do that and send them an internal message in the game. Um, so um, just some options to strategize without actually talking about it publicly. <laughs>